there's a lot of ways to discover your superpower and one of the best ways is to follow your intuition. If I do X, what's the worst that could happen? And if you can live with whatever the worst that could happen, I do it all the time. Don't go for a quick fix of your business. Be yourself, be authentic. Hang out with the people who are doing the kind of stuff that you want to do. There's endless examples of people who are traveling the world and making their money online and your whole life changes. You're listening to The Remote Revolution Show, the show that brings insights from industry experts across the world of digital business, so you too can take your business online, travel the world, and live with freedom. If you're new to the show, the podcast is produced every Tuesday for your enjoyment, and show notes can be found at www.remoterevolutionshow.com. Come back often and feel free to add the show to your favorites in your YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes feeds. If you want to follow us on social media, which you should because we're awesome, join the community by searching for at Remote Fit Pro, where you'll find daily content to help you explore the remote revolution oh yeah and if you want to connect with us individually you can do that too via the links in the show notes now let's get into this week's episode with your hosts james moody and george crawshaw hello and welcome to the remote revolution show today with your host george crawshaw and james moody and today we are joined by the legendary ben coomba if you've not heard this guy if you're in the uk you will know who this gentleman is uh, and I think he's a gent. He's a proper, genuine guy. If you're from the US or you're from somewhere that perhaps you've not heard of Ben Coomba, well, let me explain why he's so important and why he's such a, a great guy to have on the show. Well, he's got the number one health and fitness podcast in the UK. He's a very well-renowned nutrition coach, expert, an all-round a motivational character to help people go and improve their lives as a whole uh, f- across the UK. So he does lots of speaking events. Uh, he runs a company called Body Type Nutrition Academy, which helps fit pros become ultimately better coaches. Um, and he's also got a company called Awesome Supplements uh, that he's been running as well. So he's He's got his hands in lots of different businesses, and he's a he's a very great character to follow. He's a, a down to earth character, funny guy, and actually was the inspiring figure for James Moody when he got into business, got out of the corporate world and into business. James is going to share that story today, and uh, I'll I'll let him do that. So without further ado, I'm really really excited for you to get into this one. We we really talk about the the truth about building a business and building something that makes a difference uh, and why that's so important. And we talk about the real stuff, you know, that's what Ben's show is about. And he's really brought that to this episode, which we're super, super excited about. It was a great conversation, a lot of fun. And I hope that you can relate to a lot of it too. It was a very down to earth conversation. So without further ado, hope you've got pen and paper, of course, always for these episodes. And I hope you make the very most of this. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, let's get over there and, and start chatting to Ben right now. Thanks for joining us today, Ben. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you on. Thanks for having me. We, I know it took us a while, but, you know, you travel, you're often on a fucking yacht in Bali somewhere, and there's <laughs> just me and little sunny Suffolk with my dog. Uh, mate, we made it happen. Yeah, exactly. Boom. We're, we're super excited to have you on. I think James has been getting giddy before this. He was like, oh, it's Ben, but uh, like a little boy again. Uh, so I, I imagine James will be, be doing a lot of the talking today. So I'm totally cool with that. I'm excited to hear your story, Ben. Um, but yeah, let's, 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 I'll ask you the first question. Let's get started. You know, how did you get started at the very start in the fitness industry? So I was obese, um, which for anyone who's 18 and would describe that you would probably use something with a little bit few more expletives as to uh, describing that person but I was a big lad and I basically realized that or I felt that I wouldn't be successful in my career if I didn't lose weight and it was as simple as that I literally woke up one day and I was like right I'm gonna lose weight how do I do it and I just started running and all that kind of stuff loads of things didn't work and it was that inflection point of applying principles that actually worked and then seeing dramatic and rapid changes that made me think Fuck, like this nutrition stuff is really cool so trained to become a personal trainer uh worked as a personal trainer for quite a while and then over time just realized it wasn't my calling it just didn't feel right i knew fitness and nutrition was the thing but that wasn't the the vehicle and at the same time the 
fitness world was becoming popular on Facebook and everyone was, you know, creating Facebook pages and getting websites and stuff. And uh, an email went round at my university from the Enterprise Center. So that was like the uh, the young person's business uh, place at uni. And it said, have you ever thought about starting up a business? You could get a grant, all that kind of stuff. So I was like, sweet, free money, start a business. And I kind of went all in, um, got a little bit of money, got some money off my mum, then basically went as an online nutritionist, realized it was quite hard at the time to be an online nutritionist because no one wanted an online nutritionist. And then it was just about me trying to find my voice and my way and my product and how that looked and what was that? That's like a, 10 years ago now. Now, yeah, UK's number one podcast education course supplement line do lots of speaking and get you know i'm fortunate to do some really cool stuff absolute beast is what he's trying to say there in a nice polite way <laughs> oh. <laughs> boom straight into that so uh ben obviously you've been running your podcast for however many years i don't know what it was it been now dude four it's five nearly years five. nearly five years and i i, I we will get into some decent content in this, but as George said, I've literally got like, imagine imagine if you're a 14-year-old girl and you see like Justin Bieber for the first time. That's pretty much which, what's happened to me right now in my, in my chair sitting here <laughs> watch, watching Ben. And I'll, I'll tell you the reason why, like, because not many people have heard this story and you guys always love to hear my pointless stories. But uh, Ben, you actually made me, you cost me, uh, what was it, 1,500 pounds of damage to my Audi. Just a heads, heads up, all right? Ooh, that's Did, a shame because I'm a big fan of an Audi. Ah, oh, do you want you can do you want my TT off me because it sits on my drive for eight months of the year and no one has it. So you're welcome to take that. <laughs> hey, it. it is my dream to have an Audi TT again because it is an amazing car. I had a bright orange Audi TT S. <laughs> yes. sixty in like four point nine seconds. Yes. Mate, it was a beast. I loved it. So Ben, that's perfect, mate. They tried to sell me the bright yellow one. You probably bought it. When did you get it? <laughs> I'm not kidding. They did. I had that about two year, two and a half years ago. Where'd you buy it from? Um, a, a guy near Gatwick. <laughs> yeah. I shit you not. I was in the dealer at Audi like two years ago, and there was this this bright orange Audi TTS, and they were like, "This one's for you." And I was like, "It's a bit too flashy for me. It's got a bit too much going on." So I went for the plain grey one instead. But yeah, yeah. It now sits, it sits in my driveway. But anyway, um, that was in the car that I crashed. I crashed an, an Audi A1 into a traffic cone at one a.m. in the morning. Um, because so I used to drive up and down the M6 every day to go to work. And this is when I used to work um, for a big corporate and I used to drive from Manchester to Stoke every day back and forward. And I was in the gym at Virgin Active. And one of the personal trainers there was like, hey man, I know you're into nutrition and stuff and training. You should check out this podcast. And this was back when you had, um, uh, well, Anna, Anna, what was Anna's surname? Anna. Uh, Anna Sward. And I had the time had two, two listeners. So you were maybe my third. Uh, well, I, I don't think I was even that. I must've come in a little bit late because it was number 36 <laughs> when I jumped in and I was like, God, I've got to listen to 36 episodes to catch up. I'm going to skip them. And my mate was like, no, go through, listen to them all. And I binged them. I literally binged them. I would be listening to them in the car, back and forth, constant, wherever I'd go to the shops, headphone in. And it literally became like five hours a day. I shit you not, in a week, I was listening to you, like just nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. <laughs> and, I, and then I was like, this dude sounds really cool. And he sounds like he's building some good stuff. And he's a couple of years older than me. Maybe I should start looking into this. And this is how my whole journey begun. And it was like, I need to get out of this corporate job. This is not serving me. It's not serving anyone else in the world. But I want to be able to give something back. Like that was my big thing. And have freedom at the same time. Because yeah. my thing was like, and George's things too, is from school, we're funneled into this certain way of life where we're told to work hard at uni, not really have a choice in that. Like it's just, we're too young and inexperienced. We just go and do it because everyone else is doing it. We go into that, then get a corporate job. And then, you know, you'll be able to retire one day and be happy. Now, I know you get like four or five holidays a year and you get to travel the world and all that amazing stuff. And that's the life that I always wanted. And I was like, fuck, this sounds pretty damn cool. How do I get this to happen? Um, and then I have to listen to you more and more and other guys as well. And uh, you start to talk more about mindset. And it was that point I was like, shit, this stuff actually makes sense now. And uh, I, I believe you mentioned a book like How to Be Brilliant by Michael Heppel. You may, may have had yeah. him on. I actually have that on my shelf. So I went and bought that book. I was like, oh, if Ben says it's good, it must be good. So I start reading it and uh, it set all my goals out. And then one of the goals is to join BTN. And I'm like, oh, if Ben's doing it, it must be good. And the reason I'm telling this story, by the way, we'll come into this about positioning as an authority. Like Ben is a pro at this. And this is why I get buying his stuff indirectly. <laughs> um, 
so I was then at this this stage where I was like, okay, I've got my goal, I've got my world of life, I signed up to BTN, I'm doing my PT course, it's now time to quit my job. And in that moment, I was like, what do I do? I just keep listening to the podcast. So for that whole journey, that whole transition from going away from the 24 years of my life that was pre-mapped out to go down a route that I never wanted, that I was sort of pushed into, you were the guy um, indirectly who was there the whole time, that transition period. So that's why I have this big girl crush on, on Ben Coomba. Mate, but that's so, that's so cool. And I am proud and honoured to have like facilitated part of that journey. But it's literally why the podcast is there. It's not necessarily about nutrition or burning some fat or choosing broccoli over crisps. It's just, for me, it's allowing people to take that step to say, right, what is my true self? What is it that I want to do? How do I want to look? And go and do it. Just providing those tools to lose weight, move jobs, like whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just go and do it. Um, and I think that's why I've I've never actually really niched my work because I mm. feel I can't. Like there's there's so much that I want to talk about that you know a business expert would look at my business and say, Ben, you sell too many products, you do too many things, you do that, and they're all right. But I can't niche and stop because my brain is just always thinking, how can I how can I help this person? Like I'm going to film a video on Thursday and I'm going to tell a story about how my mum inspired me to be my best self. And it was just from her words as me as a kid saying, doesn't matter what everyone else is doing, just do your own thing. Doesn't matter what the school system says, just go and do what you want to do. And as a kid, all my teachers said, dude, you're going to be a retard. You're not good at maths. You're not good at English. You're not good at science. And I went and did all the arty subjects and pranced around on stage and leotard and shit. And well, fucking 10 years later, I'm doing all right. And I want to do that ode to my mum. And that's completely outside probably my niche right now. But it's a case of if I can stimulate someone to take a step to do something really cool, for me, that's a job well done. And that's the that's the truth of what anyone does. Like you, you talk about niche, and I know you're a big fan of Daniel Priestley and his work. And I saw you got to meet him the other day. How was that, by the way? Was it an incredible experience? Uh, yeah, he's he's already taken nine grand of my money. So yeah, <laughs> is that what he's charging now? Is that for the uh, the dent course? I'm doing his KPI accelerator program. Yeah, that was four grand a while ago. Motherfucker! <laughs> Literally a year ago. <laughs> it's four grand. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, man. But but I guess the reason you did that is not just the content, but to be around that level of people. Like I know you've been to Tony Robbins recently. He talks about proximity is power. How do you feel that has added to maybe the growth of, of yourself and your business as well is surrounding your people the right, surrounding yourself with the right people and also creating the tools that allow you to do that, such as the podcast, such as your books. How has that really helped you grow? I think it's only helped me grow about 5%. But I'm excited by the next 95% because I haven't quite actioned that level. There's a couple of things that have to happen in my business and they're nearly done for me to be able to do that. But the, everyone is trying to level up, right? Life's a journey. And you have to accept that there's a, a rate at which you can level up depending on your environment, which is what we're getting at. And for the last two years, I've been sitting at a pond and I don't, I don't want to big myself up, but... I'm one of the biggest fish in my pond and I need to now say to myself, well, okay, I need a new ocean. I need to be able to swim. Um, and I had to change my environment. So it's less about what's happening in my little fitness niche of like, you know, going to body power and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not discrediting that because it's an essential part of my identity and my brand in fitness, but fitness and health is huge. And the easiest comparison is for me to say, right, where's Ben Coomber at? And where's Joe Wicks at or Jamie Oliver or someone like that? And if my journey's taking myself there, what steps do I have to do to level up? Well, I'm not going to level up walking my dog twice a day, which is my only daily out, outgoing. Um, it, that's just not going to happen. So I started to say, right, what are these programs? So I went to Tony Robbins. And while that was an incredible event and it was amazing for me, it's not a pond that I want to be in because it's very far away from home. Like I don't want to be messing about in America trying to like trying to make it as a nutritionist in America because I still like my home life and I like my environment. But who's who's doing amazing stuff in the UK? And that was when I looked out to Daniel Priestley's programs and I was like, I really respect this guy. He's written books that I've read more than once. And if you've read a book more than once, you know that guy's shit is shit hot. 
it's the same with the Michael Hapel book. I've read that book like four times. It's an incredible book. So yeah, I had to level up and I'm excited. I'm only now starting to make a dent on my potential, but I'm so excited now because I feel I've got a pathway where I'm no longer confused. George is chuckling in the background because I hate the term dent. I think it's an awful brand name, but I know he's just rebranded from KPI. I understand why he's done it and everything, but George is having a little chuckle for the guys who can't see. Check it out on YouTube, by the way. Head across to subscribe over there. Um, But anyway, back to the actual show and talking to Ben. So the thing that I wanted to touch on when you were talking about all this, Ben, is the, the reason why you do what you do. It's more than fitness. Like that's, that's the vehicle right now. It's the means. And I think this is why I was attracted to you. And I think this is the truth of why your podcast has grown to the level it has. It, it has something to do with fitness and nutrition, but it doesn't. It has to do, as you said, the possibilities, the bigger reason why. So if we can be really direct right now, why is it that Ben Coomba is doing the things that he's doing right now? Why is it that you're getting out of bed every day? Why is it that you're continuing to become more and strive to get to that bigger ocean? What is the real driving force behind it right now for you? So when I decided to change career, I realized that the career path that I was on would would have made me unhappy because I wouldn't have been true to myself. So that moment I stepped into fitness and realized my physical, mental career potential, that changed my life. And in a world where people are confused, they have a lack of identity, we have mental health problems, we have people that are struggling to fucking put down the biscuit when they've already had three. Like There's, there's already so many problems in the world. And I felt that the skills that I learned were so life changing, but actually so simple. If I can spend my life passing those little anecdotes on to other people so that the penny can drop for other people, we have a world where people are living in their potential. And I don't care if people just want to be an accountant or they want to be a billionaire and own Virgin. It doesn't matter. It's just about people making that step to be true and live a life of potential because I've, I've nearly lived a life where I knew I wouldn't be happy. Mm. And I bet there's been a lot of times as well. And I think I've seen it publicly from you. Um, maybe again, indirectly from other people slating you, bashing you, doing your stuff where you've been potentially steered or, or veered off course. Some people have tried to push you off course of your mission. Um, how have you how have you managed to come over that stuff? Because I know publicly you've had some big stuff shout at you around the BTN Academy and not being what it should be and all of that stuff. Like, how have you managed to continue to keep stepping up time and time again? Well, I think you have to you have to shut yourself away from that negativity initially. You have to listen to it and you have to take it away and and and, and absorb that and become at one with that. And then you have to go back to the books you've read and the values you've written on your wall and, and really look at your purpose and say, if I walk away now, will I be fucked off in five years time that I didn't continue on that journey? And right now I am experiencing a lot of pain, whether it's emotionally, financially or whatever. And that is part of the process I had to identify of making me a stronger person. And I made um, myself a promise that I would learn everything that I need to learn to be the best that I can be. And part of that process was constantly reading the stories of other people. So I was a massive fan of Dragon's Den as I was building like my business journey. And I saw these people doing incredible things. And it wasn't just about business. It was, again, they were creating products and services that could do amazing things for people. And I said, well, I'm going to read the books of every one of these dragons. And in these books, I heard the facts that they've nearly been bankrupt. They've been shat on. People have come out in the press and dissed their products. People have tried and gone out of their way to discredit them as a business leverage tool. And I had to stand back and say, okay, is this personal? Okay, if it's personal, I need to take it on board and I need to adapt. I need to change. If this is a business move, then I need to see it as that. Like if I make the decision to go from personal trainer, coaching 30 clients on the internet, to podcasting guy, inspiring thousands of people, writing books, then I have to realize that the numbers game is going to add up to the fact that more and more people are going to hunt down my head in a business move that's potentially going to damage me. And it's literally part and part of the course. Like, I've just gone through some shit. There'll be some more shit to come, I guarantee you. You know, every day we see someone that's popular in the media, on the internet, trying to have some kind of sensational story written about them. 
and some of it's true, some of it there's a semblance of fact and it's been sensationalized, whatever. That person has to choose whether they recover from that, they grow from that and they become a better person. And I had to stand back and say, well, I'm willing to grow and become a better person. And it might not be that I can turn this around overnight by writing a nice blog. It might be that I have to spend six, nine, 12 months actually rewriting the course of what I'm trying to do and prove to everyone that I'm doing the right thing in the right way. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And I'm a big, I'm a big fan of the, the, the sort of, I'm not giving a fuck, Mark Manson. Like some of the stuff you were saying there, where he's, he talks about how there's there's constantly shit around every corner. As soon as you've gone through one heap of shit, there's another one waiting for you. Um, and I think that that's really fascinating. That you kind of like, when you expect it, it's it's not shit. It's like oh yeah, this is this is this means I'm growing, right? It's like an indicator. Um, mm. Something that you said there, where you you were able to differentiate between it being a personal thing and a business thing, like a bit, a personal piece of feedback that you needed to take on and, and deal with and a business piece of feedback that you needed to implement perhaps, uh, you know, to help your business grow. How did you, I guess there's two sides to this. It's like, how do you see the difference? Then how do you separate yourself from your business? Um, because a lot of people, certainly personal trainers are so attached to their businesses. It is them. Um, how do we, how do we make that transition or that separation so that we can, see our business as our business and us as, as a person. Yeah, I think this is more prevalent in the fitness industry than any other industry because I think there's a lot of people in fitness that got into it to, to make something of themselves and they're actually quite self-conscious people and the gym has empowered them. You know, lifting's created a physique and, you know, they've, they've sculpted um, a valuable identity of being the, the fit guy and, and now people look up to it. And... You know, what happens a lot of the time is people will give someone criticism and most people knee jerk reaction will be like, oh, you know, they're dissing me. And a lot of the time they're not dissing you. And people have to be able to stand back and just take five minutes to be objective and say, hang on, let me. And this is what I do with coaching, with business, with everything. Let me put myself in this person's shoes. Why are they giving me back this feedback? Why have I caused them pain? Have I taken money and not given them enough service? Have I upset them in some way? Did they have a malalignment of expectation of my product and my service? Well, that's not a personal reflection. That's a business reflection. It's something that I can fix. So, for example, something simple. Someone buys my book. They read my book and then they didn't learn what they expected to learn in the book. Well, maybe it's my fault because I wrote the sales copy wrong. I embellished some claims or I didn't do something properly. So it's not a personal attack. It's a direct business problem. I didn't write my marketing in line with my product. So I deserve to be hung out to dry by that person because it's me that's embellished the facts. And I think the problem is, is everyone gets caught up in their own emotion that it clouds any vision potential that they have anyway. Um, Something my mum always said to me when I was younger is, uh, if there's ever a problem, Stand back and see how you feel and then shelve the problem and come back to it tomorrow. Because it sounds silly, but time is the biggest healer and it does give clarity on these problems. And the the problem quite often doesn't need to be resolved right there and then. And you come back to it tomorrow in a calmer frame of mind. And why do you do that? Because you're no longer emotional about it. It no longer feels like a personal attack. And every attack I had online Um, you know, over the last year or whatever, I stood back and said, right, what do I need to fix? Perhaps my product is no longer the best. Perhaps I'm not doing as well as, you know, I say I like all these different things I could fix and we went away and fixed them. And now I have a much better business as a result of it. And I've grown personally and I feel stronger because I can stand against everything that I'm doing and say, no, everything I'm saying is true. Test me. Wow, that's cool. I think it's I think it's powerful certainly for for you to be like a a person of influence and being able to say that as well like it's very important if you if you want to be a person of influence if you want to build a personal brand that you must be able to be legit you know be true to your message and practice what you preach I remember I was I was uh I was doing a bit of recon on you a couple of weeks back for the show I was like doing a bit more research on you and you put a, a picture on Instagram of you with your top off in the gym 
you know, looking pretty good. And, uh, you know, you're like, yeah, I do practice what I preach, by the way. Because you don't see many pictures of you with your top off and things, nah. um, with your branding. And it was like, ah, yeah, nice. It's, it's, it's a cool little reminder. Um, James? I've got something. Ben, one of the biggest things that we see with our students is if I'm not lean, if I'm not ripped, if I'm not Instagram filtered to, like, fucking level 100, I'm not going to get clients. Where do you stand with this? Because BTN, as far as I can see, is not built on a physical paradigm as such. It's something far deeper. So how do you deal with that one? I think, you know, there's there's a way that everyone can market their business in their own way. And um, I actually did a, a mentoring call with someone about an hour before we are recording this podcast. And we were talking a lot about what everyone else is doing on the internet, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, blogging, all that kind of stuff. And the guy that sat there and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm paralyzed of how to market my business. Like, what do I use? And I said, what, what do you want to use? And what do you genuinely know that you'll probably suck at? Like, if you got in front of a camera on YouTube, do you feel scared? Does that fill you with anxiety? Then don't do it. Like, use writing as your medium and maybe choose, like, blogging and an email. Either way, you've got to allow yourself to excel at it. Like, everyone's going to fall into a trap of comparing themselves to other people. Like, you have to accept that if you want to, like, let's talk about advertising in business. We all know we need to have a, a, an ideal customer. Well, I know my ideal customer. My ideal customer isn't that bothered about its aesthetics. They want it, but it's not like they're not getting to contest prep level. They're not doing the bodybuilding thing. So I know my customer. Now, if you sit there and go, I want to coach young people to be young bodybuilders, then I'll be honest, you probably need to look like a bodybuilder. You probably need to post on Instagram that you're freaking shredded. But if you're helping an everyday mum get into shape and realize that she doesn't have to have back pain and she doesn't need to be a size 18 and she can have all that and still have a glass of wine at the weekend, then your information needs to talk to that person. And it has nothing to do with your abs. In fact, if anything, your abs might alienate her from actually being a client of yours because you're so far removed from where she's at and actually where she's going. So it's still got to come back to the goals of your business. Who are you actually trying to, um, you know, attract? I posted an Instagram post of me topless because I was like, do you know, what? I haven't done it in a while. And I literally just want to buck the trend and say, hey, by the way, actually, when I take my shirt off, I look all right. But I'm going to support my message just with this photo. But my message is I'm just here to teach you about nutrition training and getting your mindset right. Um, so I used it to reinforce my message. But my message is. I'm going to use my words and and my stories to help show you that you could be a better person than you are today. And I guess this all comes back down to knowing what you want, not what society wants. Because that's the biggest thing that I've fallen into the trap. I'm sure George has at some times. I guess we all have, where we've gone and done something for the significance of others. And again, to go back to Tony Robbins, we speak about him a lot on this show, but... We sometimes use our business as a significance tool to be like, look how fucking great I am. Look what I can build, et cetera. And that is not probably the best way to be building a business because it's not built on real foundations. It's built on ego. And let me know that ego, if you follow it long enough, eventually it's going to lead you down the, the wrong path mm -hmm. and it's going to be very hard to come back from. So Ben, I want to sort of change direction here. And I don't know if George has asked this already, but it's about positioning. It's about positioning yourself as an authority in the field. And I know from what you've done, it's taken you many years to do so. And some might argue that you were an early adopter to uh, podcasting and that was why you got such reach such early, you know, in the early days, which may be true, but the content that you were given was incredible as well. So when it comes to positioning yourself or when you made that early decision, why podcasting? What was the, the thought process behind it? So I saw a lot of popular American trainers doing great things with podcasting and it was an emerging kind of platform. And at the time, I thought America was always doing better stuff than the UK. And I think that's probably still true. America are ahead of the UK by three, four years. Um, so there's a business tip. Pay attention to what America's doing, not what people are doing in the UK because you're already behind. And I thought, you know, what? I can do that. Like, it's just speaking into a microphone. Like, I'd done, you know, vocal training to a degree. Like, I'd, I'd, I'd been an actor. What, like, what's hard about speaking into a microphone? Come on. 
So I set up the show. It took me a long time to deliberate on like the show name. Like, should it be about me? Should it be like be awesome podcast or something? And I just tried to put out the best realist content. And when I looked at the American shows, I said to myself, okay, what do I like about the shows? And what do I dislike about the shows? And the big thing was like, I disliked the cheesiness and the ads and the jingles and all that shit. So I was like, right, we're going to turn on the microphone. We're going to chat real. We're not going to edit it. And I'm going to click end. And also I'm a technophobe. Like I'm on social media and I do all this cool stuff, but I have, I have no idea how half of it works. Like I'm winging it. The podcast, I just wanted to be able to press record, stop and then upload it. And I was an early adopter in the UK, but I know lots of guys and girls that were also early adopters and they're still not around. They didn't have um, the, will, the, the staying power. They didn't have the quality of content. They weren't being honest enough. You know, they were trying to get big ads. Like I've, I've probably generated directly about two grand from my podcast in five or so years. And I know people with, you know, half my reach, you know, it may be in a part-time career, their podcast. Um, so it's never been about that. So it still comes down to quality and providing something for people in a way that they actually want it. So to be devil's advocate here and, and to look at this at a different angle, obviously directly your podcast hasn't hasn't provided you with a huge amount of income, but indirectly I'm guessing it has because it's certainly, for me, it was a gateway drug essentially. It was that first, as Daniel Priestley would say, it's the free gift. It's the free gift on the value ladder for you to move into your products. So with all of that, said the podcast that you created was a consistent thing was that a, was that a conscious effort to make it consistent every was it wednesday or tuesday that it gets released was it consistent to do that george is not a big fan is he it's a no. thursday james i thought you were his <laughs> biggest fan mate come on <laughs> i just woke up from a nap not long ago it's yeah, twice it's thursday. twice a week <laughs> There was a point in time we went to twice a week twice shows, a week, yeah. uh, Monday and a fr- Thursday, um, but I just couldn't facilitate it. It was just becoming a lot of work doing it twice a week. Um, you know, I, I believe in business that you need to create the rules and the framework and you need to test them and then you need to do them consistently. And I knew that the podcast needed to be like a radio show or a TV show. You know, people needed to almost crave listening to the show they almost wanted the ben coomba bit of dopamine so i needed it like clockwork every thursday and i've been doing that for five years every thursday consistently and i've done that with every business tactic most of the time unless i think it's not working because that's what gets you results like you have to consistently Mm. fucking apply effort or when do you pivot when do you pivot? That's the question because some people might be looking at their podcast or their blog or their video series and be like, it's not getting traction. Fuck it. I'm going to go to the new shiny object. Like, is there, is there a point that you pivot or is it just a gut feeling? Cause I know you said on your recent podcast podcast, you were like, this year was fucking hard for me. Like shit was, my back was against the wall. Like it's really fucking tough. And for the guys who haven't go and check out Ben Coomer's podcast. But, um, in that moment, you said that you were thinking about giving up the podcast. What, what got you to stick on? During that time, the podcast only really lost traction a little bit. Like the numbers went down a little bit for about three or four months. And I said, well, why is that? And the reason that was is the quality of content that I was putting out dropped. So I had to be honest and say it would be easy for me to walk away. Just because my podcast has dropped a bit, it's not a reason to run away. I'm still in the top 10 in the UK. Like don't shit the bed. Why is it not being good enough? Well, I'm maybe not getting good enough guests. Maybe I'm repeating myself. I'm not innovating enough. All of those things I can fix. I fixed them all. And in the space of two months, the show grew by 20,000 downloads a month. So I'm like, boom. Okay, grow. Put on your fucking big boy pants. But again, it's about standing back and being objective and say, well, why isn't it working? Like if you've got a YouTube channel and it's not taken off yet, perhaps you're boring. Perhaps you have to be really honest and your, your content's just not good enough to compete. So you've got two options. You be true to yourself and you pivot to a platform that is true to your voice. And perhaps that's email or whatever. Or you learn how to be interesting. Like I see so many people in my personal network that are producing content as a hybrid of loads of other people. Oh, I've seen a bit of him and I've seen a bit of that. 
and okay so that's how i'm going to do my like video stuff and i just look at that person i'm like that's not true to you and right i had this conversation with a friend of mine the other day i'm like in person you're one of the funniest people i know and on video you're not funny at all what what's with that you need to find a way to get yourself on video and show your humor because that's one of the things i like about you you're funny as shit i want to go down a pub with you because it's going to be fun but i don't want to go down the pub with that guy that i've seen on youtube and when we live in an age now where content is everywhere it's like it's, it's just ballistic right to get seen on social media now is hard work but it's also still easier than ever if you're interesting and offer value and people just want to tune in. Yeah, that's the, the most important thing is content must be entertaining above everything else. Yeah, you can write content to persuade, to sell, to inform. But ultimately, if there's no entertainment in, in today's content with the attention spans that we see everyone moving down, it's going to be difficult. And I guess that's that's testament for, for you and anyone else who has an hour-long show where you can get one someone to sit for an hour without any visuals, unless they're on YouTube, to just sit and listen and just be like, yeah, that's some, that's some good shit. So it's obviously a very powerful message if you are getting a podcast that's, that's growing just from audio. Now, Ben, the thing that I want to sort of get to from this whole podcast thing is what doors did it open for you? Because I know you started to reach out to bigger and bigger and bigger guests. And I know it's one of your life goals to, to be with Jamie Oliver. <laughs> Not in that way, but be, be, be around. I don't know, Ben, it might be. It might be. Like, he's a cool <laughs> dude. Make some good pasta. It's, you know, Mate, it's good. a man crush, but it's not that big. Yeah, okay, cool. So it's not as big as us two then. All right. No <laughs> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, that went south. Um, <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make here is it's allowed you to be in the same field as, as some bigger players. It's allowed you to skip a, a few steps ahead of maybe the pace that most people would be trending at. Was that, again, like a conscious thing to be like, I need to get a bigger guest, not only to get better information out, but to get me in a, in a, in a better growth myself personally as well? Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no lying that business is a game. You've got to play the game. Like, if someone contacts me to be a guest on my podcast, I have to look at that guest and go, okay, that guest talks about pain and mobility cool, well, there's a thousand people, if not more, that talk about pain and mobility. This guy's got 1,200 people on Instagram. Mm, this guy's got 84,000 people on Instagram. So even if the, you know they're similar or whatever, you're going to choose the guy with 84,000. It's a game. Like, I need to keep expanding my network. Why? Because my mission is to help people on this journey of change. So I've got to keep growing. So I've got to keep trying to pick my chances. I've got to keep trying to be bold. And like last year, I, was, well, I wasn't bold at all. And later on this year, I'm going to get really freaking bold. Like the amount of people that remember me standing in front of 5,000 people live on a microphone to ask C.T. Fletcher at Body Power if he'll come on my podcast. Like so many people remember that because, yes, it was bold. But the thing is, not many people would do that. Not many people would have the audacity to do that. And you've got to have the audacity. And I, I talk about this to personal trainers all the time. They're like, oh, what's the secret of business and all this shit? I'm like, you've got to go and create it and take it. Like, no one gives it to you. You don't get past a baton or a fucking gold star or anything like this. You just go and create it and you take it. Like, oh, you've got the UK's number one podcast. Yeah, because I took that title. I went and found the people. I went and did the work. If someone becomes a best-selling author, they decided to have the audacity to want and go and be a best-selling author. And the audacity is something that people don't take. And, and it, it, it's like in the back of people's minds, they still think there's this like, there's this unwritten process that people have to take or do in the journey of business. There isn't. There's no rules anymore. The landscape is flat. The world is flat. You go and create and do whatever you want. Shit. And that is why I like Dent's. We were talking about Dent earlier. That's yeah. why I like Dent's new slogan. Uh, what is it? Be be brave, have be fun, make a dent. Yeah. I'm like, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. My job is fun. I'm trying to make a dent and I'm I'm going to be brave with it. Daniel Prince has done his research. Nailed. The reason why I'm not I'm not going to go into this in detail, but we, we drew up this big sheet of like brand name ideas and rebranding and what we wanted to do and what we wanted it to mean and feel to someone and what was that emotion that the brand was meant to create. And uh, George just put dent. I like this one. And, and, that, and I'm like... 
But on its own, what does Den actually yeah. mean? Like on its own, it's when you know what Daniel Priestley stands for, yeah, it becomes very powerful. You need the tagline with it. Yeah, you need the tagline. And we've, we're Daniel Priestley whores as well. Like we've read every single book and like I'll buy it on Kindle and George goes and buys our shared Amazon account and uh, buys it on Audible. So it costs us twice as much but because <laughs> he refuses to read books. But Daniel Priestley is a prime example of someone who is like just bucking the trend. I find it really interesting because he has his methodology and he is very, very passionate about sharing his process all the time and he doesn't hold anything back like a lot of guys we see in the fitness industry are like i'm not going to give you my best formula because that's what i'm going to reserve for everybody else but people like daniel Priestley are like here's everything go and get this thing it's three quid it's absolutely inc incredible you follow it will change your life and i guess that's what it comes down to is is being willing to put yourself out there have a methodology that people can follow and then being very clear that just follow this one methodology once front to back multiple times and you'll be fine instead of hopping from one thing to the next and i think that's what myself and a lot of other fitness professionals become guilty of and, and people in business is they try and absorb everything at once and it's just like this fucking car crash in our heads because it's just like social media there's a million things and we can't absorb it all so when you're when you're really looking at new strategies ben and i know you're going to probably say i trust my gut which is the right thing to do but who do you tend to look for for advice yeah big one is myself i believe that Ultimately, I will look and draw from the experience of others um, in my network, but ultimately it has to come back to me. And if I don't feel it's right, I don't feel it's the right strategy, and the, 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 the chances are there's multiple strategies I can take. There's no one way to do things right. I have to take all that information in and I say, right, okay, this journey feels true to me. And, you know, you mentioned the podcast I recorded last year. I took a lot of steps that weren't true to me. And actually, it ended up in a huge amount of pain because I didn't listen to myself. And actually, all of those steps were right in someone's business in some way, but they just weren't in my business in my way. So um, I think there's a fine line between following your gut and being true to yourself, but also not being arrogant and blind that you think you know the right answer when the proof is in the pudding. If I do something that's true to my gut and I prove to myself and see growth and change, then I have a reason to trust myself. But if you're that idiot that keeps going, oh, I know best, like, you know, that guy who's made millions doesn't, and you keep failing and not growing, then you've got to, dis you've got to disassociate yourself from your ego because your ego is the thing that's damaging your business. And I do think there's a fine line there and that, you know, that just takes a bit of time, a bit of self-reflection and being objective. And ultimately, that's where you've got to look at the numbers because the numbers don't lie. What stuff are you tracking, by the way, Ben? What's your main main sort of metrics right now for your for your growth, for your business? What are you looking at? Uh, I'm an idiot. I don't look at a lot. Um, I look <laughs> at the bottom line. Um, do you know what I don't? It's because I go, I, I, I use my gut so much. Like I just... Mm. But, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this a lot. He's like, I know if things are working, I can just see it on the internet. I can see the traction and the feel of what people are saying. And I, I buy into that so much. I think I'm a hugely intuitive person. So I usually trust my intuition and then go and look at the numbers and back it up and, and, and often confirm it. Um, we'll look at things like uh, general growth on our social media. Like, are we doing cool shit? Like, people, are people engaging in our work? Like, despite everyone moaning about the Facebook algorithm changes and all that kind of stuff, like, are people still engaging? Are the numbers going up? Um, we'll then obviously look at general sales. If our marketing, and this is the only rule that I follow in marketing, if our marketing is effective, we will make sales. It doesn't matter if it's December or July so or true. Hanukkah or Easter, good marketing makes sales. It's it. So if you're not making sales, you're not marketing effectively. And I see it time and time again in my business. My accountant always says to me, um, you know, oh, you're going to have a down <laughs> month in December. I'm like, fuck that. I'm going to find a way to crush December. And I remember having one of my biggest ever months in business in December when apparently everyone's eating themselves into a, you know, a Volavon coma. Good marketing makes money. Nice. And good product makes money. Yeah, for sure. You've got to have the proof. I think the big thing around marketing right now is having the ability to prove what you do and how it works. And, you know, you've got a lot of that, but you didn't have that to start with, did you, Ben? So... Like how how did you make sure that you got that proof on your journey? Well, 
I think you've got to keep looking at the evidence. You've got to look at what people are saying. Like the great thing about our business is, is testimonials can sell, you know, a thousand times over again. So I'm always looking at what people are saying. And again, I'm not really one to post that many like transformations and stuff like that. And so sometimes actually it's a little bit hard to promote my business because I am promoting like Dave down the road who's just made a mindset shift, but actually it's changed his life. And he's only lost six kilos, but he's changed his life. Um, and like just coming back to my last point, because I, w- I, w- I want to make sure we bring this up because it's a, it's a big lesson that I learned last year, is that in the service industry, you're fortunate enough to, that if you do something wrong, you can fix it very quickly. It's like if you pay for an hour of my time and I don't deliver, I can go, well, let me give you another hour of my time and see if I can rectify that. It's easy. With a product, you don't get that opportunity. Like if I sell you a shit tub of protein and it tastes like crap, the person doesn't even really want another one. Like they're like, look, I'll just go and buy the side tech protein because I know it tastes the right. And we learned this last year. We developed a couple of products that didn't taste well enough and it didn't take off. Then halfway through last year, we developed our vegan protein and it's become our number one seller literally within the space of a month. Why? Because it's an incredible product and people cannot shut up about it. And I'm immensely proud of it. But I did the due diligence and it's probably the most work I've ever done to say to you know, my manufacturer, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, to the point that my manufacturer wants to punch me in the face repeatedly. I'm like, dude, if we get this right, I'm putting money in your pocket, come on. And we nailed it. And I think when you get a product that's that good, it's hard not to be able to sell it. So a business Um, lesson, is your product good enough? That's it. Yeah, yeah. George and I, we, we spoke about this openly on the podcast as well. When we started doing what we were doing, like it wasn't, it was not good enough what we were we were providing people with. And we went down the whole route of, like you said, we, we couldn't give people more time. We just have to give money back to them. We'd have to have incurred a huge cr- cost in our business of all the manpower, of all the team, of everything, and then say, here's your money back. Because it would just tarnish the business completely if we were just like, oh, actually, we're just going to take your money and, and fucking do one. Like, it's... It's not gonna not gonna be good in the long run at all. So I can completely understand the importance of a good product. And like you said, that's what makes a contagious product ultimately is it sells itself. Because I see people all the time tagging you in posts about awesome supplements in the vegan protein. I see it all the time. It's like littered on my newsfeed because you're tagged in it and I follow you. And it's just like it's everywhere. So it becomes this this thing where you're omnipresent indirectly through your product, which is like this incredible result of you putting time into building something. Um, now the thing, speaking of so- social media, which I find fascinating and George is trying to dig into this with our own branding right now is you have, I don't know how many companies you got, is it two main companies, three, your BTN, awesome subs and probably my own stuff, Ben Coomba. Yeah. Ben Coomba. How, how do you run not the technical stuff, but how do you run the, the front of house to that? So what the public sees, how do you decide, right, I'm going to be writing X for awesome subs, or I'm going to be the face of BTN, or I'm just going to do my personal stuff. I'm going to take the Instagram account of Ben Coomba today. And then how do you manage that? What's the decision process? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, For a long time, I managed and did content for literally everything. So right now, currently, I manage all my own content podcast, all the rest of it. And I have people in the background that, you know, might edit a few things and create some graphics and all that kind of stuff. But my content is is my own and it should always be my own because I am me, you know. And actually, this one part of my job I really enjoy. I enjoy sharing my thoughts and my work on social media. Body Type Nutrition is a little bit of me, but it's mostly our head of education, Tom. And again, he is the most appropriate person to talk about what we're doing because he's in it every day. He's teaching the students and doing the research and all that kind of stuff, as I did when I was building BTN. Awesome Supplements is then, again, a little bit of me. And then it's mainly my head of marketing, who's my brother. Um, And then Tom feeds in a little bit. Our athletes feed in a little bit. So I've got a two-person marketing team. Um, you know, and they have skills in video editing, graphic design, podcast editing, all that kind of stuff. And they are full time and they're loaded with work to do. Like on their plate right now is probably six months worth of work just waiting to be done. And that is the problem with, you know, the business that I have set up 
there's a lot going on every day and partly it's my energy, partly it's the business that I've done, but more than anything is how much I want to do. Like people that want to share an incredible message have always got too much shit going on. Like you look at Jamie Oliver, how many businesses that guy's guy got? And he's lucky that he's got incredible teams, but he's probably struggling just as much as I am because he wants to do more. He wants better people around him. He wants uh, you know, a bigger market because he can affect greater change. So I, I don't think that will ever change. Like the, the problems an entrepreneur has will always be there unless they don't want to grow. So my podcast that has been referenced a couple of years, the hardest year of my life, talked about me um, fighting going bankrupt. Now, I could have happily, not happily, I could have easily sat on my income and earn a comfortable uh, 120, 140 grand a year, which is an amazing salary for anyone. But that wasn't my mission. The mission isn't about the money. The money just came as a byproduct of me doing a good job. The mission was to build a company that impacted a huge amount of lives. So then I made the step of like, shit, okay, to get to the next level, I'm going to have to invest one, 200,000 pounds in stock, websites, resources, staffing, all the rest of it. And, um, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I actually signed off my end of year account yesterday and we've grown something like 65% in revenue and I've only generated another 25,000 pounds in profit. And that's actually only because we fiddled our numbers to make us look slightly better. See, I can always have the advantage of trying to get finance because otherwise I wouldn't have any finance potential if my business came into a problem. So actually, I've still not turned any profit after that year because I'm building. And I looked at our investment and we've invested something like 240 grand in one year alone in systems, staff, in resources and all the rest of it. Why? Because it's the mission that I chose. And whether you stop a, a one-man band that's doing great or you build a lifestyle business or, as Daniel Priestley calls it, a performance business, either of those things are fine. Not everyone's destined to be a, a Richard Branson, but as long as you define where you're going and are true to that, you'll, just, you'll have a business that has a purpose and you'll be happy with it. Nice, yeah. Where are you going, Ben? What's, which, which one's for you? Mm. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> if I'm honest, I don't I don't want to sit here and say I'm going to build like a, a Jamie Oliver enterprise because there's a point where I might decide that I'm no longer happy with that. Like I actually don't want that many balls juggling in the air. If I feel I could do an incredible job with a team of like 10 people and, you know, three businesses doing X, Y and Z, then then I'd be happy at that. But if all the time I'm waking up with that hunger to go bigger and better and bolder, then I'll keep doing that. So there's there's no limit to myself, but I'm not going to sit here and arrogantly say, like, I'm building an empire. Because if, if one day I wake up and that doesn't make me happy, because there's a limit to everyone's stress potential. Like, in the next, like, year or two, I want to have kids. And I don't want to miss out on my, my kid's childhood in any way because I'm flying around the world building a satellite office in fucking Australia just to put another 200, uh, 2 million pound revenue on my bottom line when really it doesn't matter. So I think like anyone, I'm always going to stand back and be objective and say, is my business serving me right now? Do I feel happy? Am I comfortable financially? Am my family happy? Cool. Well, I can just stop and cruise and that's okay. Or I can keep building. I guess that's the absolute key. It's always reassessing what you want in that moment because our goals change. Like I remember when I first started my business, I still have it on this whiteboard up here. It says uh, housing deposit, uh, 30K, 27th, 1st of Jan, 2017. When I first started my business, that was my goal. And I was sitting on a coaching call like a year before that came and I was like on track to hit that goal. Everything was good. And then I was like, my, I was just so fucking overwhelmed and lost and didn't want to do anything. I was just like, I can't be asked for this. Like I'm fed up. And it, all, it transpired that the goal that I'd set was arbitrary. It wasn't really what I wanted. It was just that what I thought I should be doing. What I wanted to do, is, as we sort of touched on, is, is travel the world and live remotely. That's what I really wanted to do and enjoy that lifestyle for at least a couple of years. So only when I made that switch and let my ego go and what everyone else would think about me, because that was my big thing on my shoulders, it was like, fuck, like, 
I created this business so I could be impressive to other people. And when that penny dropped, I was like, that's not the reason you want to be getting into the business. You want to go back to that original cause, which is always serving the mission. And George and I have got this big thing right now where it's like, we believe in what we call the remote revolution, which is where everyone has the opportunity, if they so wish, to move online and travel the world and live in freedom. If that's what they want to do, that's great. And uh, that's what we now serve at a deep level. And, and like you're doing right now, Ben, is you're spreading your, your mission, your, what you believe in, and you're doing it for free. Like, you're not earning any money of us for doing this. But that's what I find really interesting is work doesn't seem like work when you're completely aligned. And I imagine risk doesn't seem like risk when you're completely aligned and all of those things. Because I bet when the accountant's saying to you, you're fucked, you're going to be bankrupt. You obviously like, I'm going to make this work. But you never see that risk as maybe a normal person would because you're so zoned into your mission. You say that's correct? Yeah. And then, you know, if, if at any point I stand back and that scares me, like, oh, how am I going to get out of this problem? Then you haven't got yourself into that problem in a true way. You know, we, we've talked about being true to yourself so much on this podcast, but it is so true. Like my friends and my family and, you know, especially my girlfriend looked at me and she goes, well, what the fuck are you going to do? And I'm like, and I literally said, don't worry about it. Like, I'm not worried about it. Like, and I'm staring down the barrel of having to find 20 grand one month. She's like, well, how are you going to do it? And I'm like, I'll think of something. Don't worry about it. Trust me, I've done it before. I'll do it again. Like, uh-huh. the more I get stressed about it, the less clarity I'm going to have. So if you get out of my grill and stop stressing me out, I'll find a solution. And then if you give me the space and time to get it done, I'll get it done. And I got it done. And don't get me wrong, still, you know, things aren't comfortable now because the realities of business is, you know, there's, there's things that have to be done and you've got to have a certain amount of patience. But we're going in a really healthy direction. And what I'm doing is paying off. Like the hundreds of thousands that I've invested over the last two years is paying off. But I am doing it in the right way and I'm doing it my way. And, you know, someone could have slapped me around the face first of January last year and said, you're doing that wrong, you're doing this wrong. But I believe I had to learn these lessons the hard way because, you know, maybe George pointed this out. Perhaps I am on course to create a huge and inspiring health empire. And if I didn't learn this lesson right now, it's going to bite me really hard because the reality is I could have lost my house. Okay, cool. So I've lost, a, oh, I don't know, like an 80,000 pound investment. Fast forward three years down the line, I might lose 10 houses and I might ruin 12, 15, 20 people's jobs. So I think you've always got to just stand back and go, mate, it could have been a lot worse. You could have lost, you know, millions and screwed up loads of people's jobs. And I didn't. But I learned enough that now I'll never I will always see it coming. Mm. I love that point about other people's jobs because George and I are in the same position now. We've got a team of what, five people. We've got six, four, five, six people. Six. That's really bad. Sorry, team. We've got a team of six. We've got a team of six people at the moment, and uh, I've literally got it on my my board right now. And it says, "Be responsible for the revolution and its members." That's what it says on my board right now. It's because that makes it bigger than me. Because when it's just me, and when I used to just run Naked Nutrition, it was just really about me and making sure I hit ten grand a month and everything was good. But honestly, I was more stressed, more like just in a horrible place mentally with that company because it wasn't aligned to my values. And now when I see other people buying into our philosophy and what we stand for, it suddenly becomes something that is actually exciting. It's something that becomes I become so much more responsible for it. And I feel like this isn't just for me now. This is a purpose bigger than me. It's something that's going to it's going to transpire further than my life can go. And George, you said this the other day when we were chatting, you were like, what happens if you set a 300 year goal for your business? Like you were saying this, weren't you from London real? You're like, yeah. what would, what would that look like? Cause that, that is bigger than your lifetime. It's impossible. So what would that truly look like to do that? And that, that comment that you made, George, I was just like, that's it. That's what this revolution that we're building is all about. And I guess with Ben, with your mission of change, it's bigger than you, bigger than your lifetime. Yeah, I love it. And if I, if I wouldn't, have my house and be in a relationship that kind of stuff and i'm not saying i don't want to have that i'd probably be traveling around the world with my laptop as well because i can and 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 that's you know people say to me oh even like even last year i took like five or six holidays because every penny i did have i used to spend to go away on holiday why because i i love it i love traveling and experiencing cultures and you know just enriching myself as a person so I think what you're doing is an amazing. Um, 
the only thing that I would make trainers question is that we're seeing so many cool things happen on the internet. And while that is very valuable, don't see that as an easy way out. No way should you go, oh, I'm doing shit in my job at Virgin. I've only got 12 clients. I'm going to try and do it on the internet because Ben Cooper's doing it and he's crushing it. Or my mate with abs down the road's crushing it on Instagram. I would say making it as an online trainer in some way is harder than offline because it takes a long time to build a relationship. 100% harder. Exactly. I can walk into my local gym today, now, and start building relationships because I'm in person. How am I going to target that person on the internet? It's going to take me far, far longer. So I just, while we have an amazing opportunity with technology, it is not a shortcut. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that, Ben, because we probably, we don't say that enough. And obviously you've seen it in, in our message just today of like what we believe in and that's the downside that we probably don't say enough so um i really appreciate you saying that because we do get people and we've made this mistake before right george we've taken on people who aren't a good fit and we've done it because of money i think everyone who's you know business owners done that from time to time is they've made the wrong decision because of again ego and money and significance and everything else um so yeah guys like for you guys listening anything is possible i remember Ben used to have a t-shirt that said nothing's impossible or something along those lines. Um, might be your podcast front cover. Is that right? Nothing's impossible. Uh, yeah, it's on my t-shirt that's on all of my social media platforms. Which is genius, by the way, because you see the same picture time and time again and you just Boom. realize it's Ben. That's why I've never changed it, I guess. But the point I'm making here, guys, is nothing is impossible, right? Whether it's probable is a different matter. And you guys creating a business of freedom and lifestyle is completely possible. But as we've seen by the amount of personal trainers who become PTs, then quit, try and start their own businesses and fail, it's not probable. So be very aware of what what Ben sort of shared with you there. Like getting to that level is incredibly difficult. And I think the key to it is having, like we said, a mission bigger than yourself and something that you're truly aligned to. And uh, you, you, well, I, know, I, I know this is true of me, but I don't see risk as most people do. I think Ben's the same. Like he's clearly said, <laughs> I'll fix it. It doesn't matter, which I love. Nice. Yeah, I think the big thing that I've got from you today, Ben, is uh, is we must have the ability to understand ourselves and have that self-awareness to know what is true to us. And we must then take action. We must actually do things, do the work, you know, do what is necessary to to get what we want. Like if you do want to go online, then you've got to understand, is this going to be true to me? Is this really what I want? You know, is the work really what I want? And uh, go and help, go and do it. Go and get it done. Yeah, and I think if people are listening to this and they're not sure, you've got to try. Like sometimes you just don't know till you have a stab. Like I went and worked in elite sport for a year because I had a huge desire to work with athletes. I did it for a year and I was like, no way am I doing that. Like that's just not me. But I had to go and do it for a bit. So. You know, don't be scared to try. I think, you know, I always say to people that go to university, for me, university isn't a chance to get a degree. It's a chance to try everything and anything under the sun because at uni, you've got a chance to do everything. You've got a chance to go to the best nights out, do the best courses, be linked up with the best organizations, get funding for cool things. Like I worked five jobs when I was at uni, did two internships, worked in pro sports, set up two businesses. Why? Because all this shit was staring me in the face, but I had the audacity to go and take it. When the lecturer stood up at the beginning of the lecture and was like, right, who wants the uh, placement at whole KR? I was like the first hand in the audience to go up. While everyone else was thinking about it, I was like, fuck it, let's just dive in, let's do it. So there's definitely an element that you've just got to try and maybe burn your fingers a little bit, maybe waste a grand here and there, you know, try and what's the worst that's going to happen? You're just going to waste a bit of your time. Awesome. On that note, I think we'll wrap things up. And as always, uh, we like to ask our guests because we've got lazy listeners who don't actually like to look at the comments. How do they get hold of Ben Coomba? Um, uh, you can Google <laughs> or put into any social platform Ben Coomba. Uh, my podcast is Ben Coomba Radio. My website is Ben Coomba. My Facebook, Instagram and everything else is Ben Coomba. So I'm pretty easy <laughs> to find. Does yeah. that mean you've made it when you become just searchable by Google? And like you are the first six pages on all different platforms. You made it right. I'm quite a lot of the first pages, yeah. Yeah, is it because there's one Ben Coomba, or have you just really nailed your SEO? Uh, I think I've <laughs> a bit of both. Um, I don't think I can put on my business card quite yet. Google me, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. That would be the day.
Oh, I'm so good. So final question, Ben. Um, we like to ask this of every single guest who comes on. It's a big thing for us. It's a big thing of our mission, and I'm sure it is you too. And that is, what does freedom mean to you? Wow. I think freedom for me is getting up every day and know that I'm doing the right thing. Um, I think freedom in a lot of people's eyes is to you know, do anything and anything whenever you want. Like there's still hard work attached to what I do, but the hard work I do is, is worth it. It has me de- meaning and I don't feel trapped by it. I feel free as a result of doing it and it allows me to do all the things. One of the biggest goals I had in business was never to worry about money from just an everyday spending perspective. If I walked into a shop and I'm like, fuck, those shoes are really cool and they're 75 pounds. I don't want to have to worry about spending 75 pounds. I'm not trying to get to the point where I can just walk up to a helicopter and be like, yeah, I'm just going to buy that helicopter. Like, but for me, that's an amazing sense of freedom of just being able to live a rich, normal life. Because as soon as you go beyond that, you alienate yourselves from a lot of everyday people anyway. Like, most of my friends are just nice, cool, everyday people. And I want to be a nice, cool, everyday guy that but does do some really cool shit from time to time because I'm fortunate enough to have those opportunities and maybe the money to support it. So I think that's freedom for me. It's kind of an inner sense of purpose and ability to live passionately every day. Nice, love it. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming on, Ben. Yeah, I really appreciate this, man. Thank you, fellas. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to reach out for me after today, uh, you know where to find me. Type my name into the internet. Thanks for listening to the Remote Revolution show. If you enjoyed the show, please head across to iTunes, YouTube, and our other social media platforms to leave us a quick rating and review. And if you'd like your questions answering, we'd love to hear from you. So please send them into info at remoterevolutionshow.com. And please remember the show is all about growing the remote revolution. So if you wish to join the community and scale your business, then please head over to www.remoterevolutionshow.com or click the link in the show notes to grab our free download. Yes, seriously, don't be lazy. Click the link in the show notes and grab the downloads. And as always, we'll see you next week.